I'm really horrible at intros. Um, I hope everybody realizes this. I thought I would just make a quick little, it's not quick, it's not gonna be quick. <laughs> I'm not, I know that now because I know myself, um, of kind of 10 pieces of advice that I would like to give based on my experience in college, but also starting. I mean, this could apply to really anybody and it should apply to anybody. Um, not like it should, like I'm demanding, but I, it's, it's something that helped me um, progress and learn as a filmmaker and made college worth my time and my energy. Uh, and I, I'll go into a whole spiel about the pros and cons of school at some other point. But for now, this is just 10 pieces of advice from me that um, I think helped me be successful at school for the, f for the film industry and then, you know, helping me understand certain boundaries and, and stuff like that. So, here we go. Let's do it. <laughs> As we do, we do the thing. Right, left, okay. Na, 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 na. Anyway. Number one, my number one advice to anybody starting in school as a freshman would be to get in with the seniors or the juniors or just like the older, the older people. Whether it be acting, ACing, you know, doing slate, um, PAing, or even just asking, hey, um, can I help you on your set? Uh, is there anything you need? Uh, I'm just trying to learn and, and uh, figure out this industry and whatever. That really helps. It helped me. So I ended up actually acting a lot, um, surprisingly. <laughs> um, I was in a lot of really funny movies. Uh, I would say, um, learn from their lighting techniques, learn from their, um, their, how they direct, um, see how they work with actors, because by this point, if they're a senior or junior, they have at least a couple year, years of experience of dealing with being on set or, uh, casting actors and, uh, working with actors and stuff, so, I'm trying to remember the first set I was on. I remember I was an AC, and it was so exciting for me, you know, to be a little freshman. Like, oh my gosh, the seniors are letting me hang out. <laughs> I don't know anything about movies. <laughs> so even seeing how they write scripts. And with helping the seniors, you never know. In the end, they could help you when you decide to make your first movie. Um, I think there was only two instances maybe that I asked for their help because for me I was like I don't want to waste your time with these really shitty movies I'm about to make uh, but I like your advice or I would ask you know hey like, I'm trying to light this scene how would you how would you go about it you know what um you know what technique would you use or what grip equipment would you use? I'd ask a lot of those questions because obviously they have more experience with that. And I'm like, oh, like I remember asking uh, my friend Carissa, um, she's a DP in Dallas. I remember, I remember asking her, hey, I'm trying to light the scene outside and um, I don't really know, what do you think I should do? How do you think I should light it with a, like, should I use moonlight? Like, what light should I use? You know, just asking her opinion. And she actually spent the time and came out for a little bit um, and helped me out with that. And so that was really nice of her. Uh, always love getting on the older, the older people's sets. Um, <laughs> I learned a lot, or a lot of them were just really funny and uh, fun to be around. So advice number two is don't be afraid to write or direct something that people may not understand. Write something that's personal to you and makes sense to you. Let it, let it come from your experiences. Even if it's not something that anybody else can 
relate to. Sometimes those are the best movies because they're told from your point of view and only you will know the true meaning behind behind your film. I see a lot of kids not even kids. I see a lot of people making movies that have already been made. That's easy. Why would you want to do something easy when you're starting out? Take advantage of not having the world judge your movie. When you're in college or when you're starting out, people view other people differently when you're in when you say you're in school versus when you're out of school or you're not in school. Uh, when you're in school, people are saying, oh, you know, you're still learning, you're cute, and, you know, they, they give you an advantage in that way, they don't judge you as harshly, versus, even if you're the same age as somebody else, and you're not in school, but you're working in the industry, they're, they're gonna look at you very different, especially your movies. It's okay to try to make a movie that doesn't necessarily may be amazing. You know, just go for it. Just make something crazy. You know, do something that that makes you happy and not necessarily do something make not necessarily make something that somebody else would want you to make. It's okay to to try to recreate something you've seen in a movie. That's fine. Uh, I'm just saying, make it your idea. There's just a lot of college students that make movies about college. That's like my biggest, that's my biggest pet peeve. I made a 30 minute short and then after that happened, we applied for an internship to the Cannes Film Festival. I ended up seeing uh, Kristen Stewart's Come Swim short film that she did, she directed. Very experimental. I'll play on the visuals and the sounds and the music. It was all very important. I, I enjoyed her film. I did see Kristen Stewart. I did not meet Kristen Stewart, but I feel like she'd be a dope person to hang out with, to be honest. It made me realize that you don't have, your, your films don't have to have real dialogue. It can be super experimental. I don't know why I didn't think about this before, but I didn't. So after that, I came up with The Golden Dream as one of my films, which was all made with storyboards at first. It was all visual. There was no dialogue. Um, something that I pictured in my head. I think it is still one of one of the most, uh, one of the films I'm most proud of because it was so difficult. I found that I didn't have to have a bunch of dialogue to make a good movie. You know, I don't know if anybody tells you that. A lot of actors find it very fun and interesting to do something that is even challenging for them. I was watching an interview with Daniel Radcliffe talking about Swiss Army Man. He said he read, he read the script and he was excited for it. He's like, this is something, this is something different. It's challenging for me. It's weird. It's... It's not just exciting for you as a director or a writer, it's interesting for the actors as well. Alright, advice number three. Try to make a short film based on a situation instead of a whole life story. And try to keep it in between around 7 to 10 minutes at max. So a lot of students, or just people, Try to condense a full feature length movie into a 7, 10, 30 minute short film. This is unnecessary. Either make it a short film or make it a feature film. 30 minutes is way too long. It might as well be a feature and I know because I made one. <laughs> it's just, it's hard to make a character have a full life realization in 7 minutes. It's, it is difficult. There will for sure be lack of character development. And I'm not saying it's impossible. I just know that after my personal experience, even my professor was like, it's too long. You gotta kill your babies, as my professor would say. I really hope this doesn't destroy my wall. Oh.
I didn't want that wall anyway. Any time that our film program would show us a movie, it would always be movies. Big films, feature films. And I see so many students trying to cram a feature film into a short film. Make a scene that can empower somebody or, you know, it doesn't even have to be a scene, like just a bunch of uh, different cuts, different small scenes. You're trying to make a point, you know, something that you believe in. Try to keep it at least seven minutes. Seven minutes is a good, not too short, not too long length, I believe. In a 30 minute short, you kind of just like lose momentum and you lose interest. Advice number four. Write or direct something that makes you feel uncomfortable. Something that makes you go out of your comfort zone. You know, whether it be genre, style, time period. That really uh, challenges your abilities uh, and your patience. Uh, challenging yourself is part of growing and how are you supposed to grow if you're constantly doing stuff that you're comfortable with. Um, and who knows? You may find something that you didn't know you enjoyed till you tried it. So since making movies is, um, isn't just solely on one person, you have other people there to help you validate your idea, help you write the script. I also think it's very important to make yourself do research, to look up things that you don't know anything about. There are plenty of filmmakers out there that do that all the time. Me and my friend Juliet did a fight movie our freshman year. Uh, I watched a couple movies. Uh, one of the main movies I referenced was Million Dollar Baby. I learned a lot in that watching movies and learning uh, about camera angles and fighting techniques. I had to get a stunt coordinator for that. Finding the right like locations and the right actors. Uh, it was very challenging, but I learned a lot just from just from doing something that I wasn't necessarily comfortable with or knew uh, knew anything about. You know, I, I, actors do a lot of the research as well. I was watching a Hollywood Reporter, and it had Adam Sandler, Jamie Foxx, Adam Driver, Robert De Niro, Tom Hanks, and Shia LaBeouf. Adam Sandler was uh, in a movie, Uncut Gems, and he was a gambler and a jeweler. And he was talking about how he had to do a lot of research for that movie because he knew nothing about gambling uh, or like the obsession of gambling or how to be a proper jeweler. He said that Josh and Benny Safdie, I believe is how you say their names, uh, the directors of the movie actually got them got him the connections to be able to talk to some people that were pretty intense gamblers. Like gamblers that like lost their life to gambling with the just having the obsession uh, of it. He actually said he spent a full like few days b with them in their shop and learning how they sell jewelry. Uh, he said he learned a lot from why they threw their lives away for it, what in their mind at the time it was for them, so that he could play the character and relate to it. And I'm sure that the char uh, that the directors did the same thing. Advice number five I have is casting. Uh, what I did when it came to casting and how I was able to find the actors I wanted. Now normally, I guess anywhere, there's a community for film people or actors or whatever. Be like, hey, I'm having auditions at this time, at this place, this is what the movie's about, blah, blah, blah. What I found that most people did was they just expected these people just to kind of show up. I know when it comes to casting calls and stuff like that, like here in Austin or any bigger city, it's a lot different because you have a lot more abun you have an abundance of people and you also have a lot of people that that want to be cast want to be known because it's a it's a larger group of people and because our community was a little bit smaller and most of the only people that we knew would be from the theater the theater com community at school and a lot of the times they would be way too busy um, to really help anybody out but 
what helped me was I would go to their theater page, I would look up everybody in the theater page, and I would message people individually. You know, I would say, hello, how's it going, whoever I'm messaging. I'm doing a short film and I would really like for you to audition. Um, now, I'm not saying that I just did this just to get people. I just felt that if you write a personal message and you're like, I would like you to audition for my movie, they take it a little more serious and that, you know, I, I would pick some people that I was like, I want you to audition because I kind of have you in mind. And then there were some people where I was like, I just want you to audition because you could have, you could be the part. I'm not sure. I'd rather have an abundance of, of options than not enough options. Um, and then I would have about maybe 20, 15, 20 people that show up each time. And so that helped out a lot. And that way I also had confirmation on who was going to show up and who didn't have time. And then some people that are like, yo, yes, I'm interested in auditioning, but I'm really busy these next few weeks because I have a show coming up. Uh, why don't you hit me back up in the fall or whatever. And... I'd be like, okay, cool. So I keep those people in mind for future auditions. Just to also see, because there are some people in the theater community that I just didn't know. I've never met before. Some people I met at parties. Sometimes I met because I met other people because I go to their shows um, and I meet them through there. It broadened my connections, which helped me for the downline. But you also never know. You could find the perfect actor for you. You could find your Samuel L. Jackson to Quentin Tarantino. You never know. The actor that I have always enjoyed working with because he's so versatile and I feel like he needs more recognition. Uh, his name is Thomas Elam. I found him through this the theater page and he's like, yo, I actually don't, I don't really, I'm not in school anymore. I was like, oh, what are you doing? It's like, I'm working at Walmart in Nacogdoches. And I'm like, oh, okay. Do you still want to act though? He's like, yeah, I wouldn't mind it. I was like, oh, well, I'm holding auditions. Uh, if you want to come by, you know, I'd be really interested in you auditioning. And I needed the right guy. I needed him to play a psycho. He's like, okay, dope. Oh. Oh, fucking, fucking, oh, I hate you all. Oh, please don't tell me I'm gonna fucking die, you bitch. God, motherfucker, dude. Fuck, I'm out. Oh, fuck, I hate these dudes. Hell no. No, 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 no. Bro, you're making me travel weird places. I'm just trying to get them also away. Oh, it's glitched. <laughs> okay. As I was saying, I was challenging him to to know how to act without me over explaining. During an audition, I'll make sure that they can at least take my direction and change something. What will they do with this new information? Uh, where will they go with it? How crazy will they get? Um, and then you just see the potential that they they have. It was crazy because he was my very last audition and was my best audition for the role. And I was really excited uh, that I just happened to find this really great actor that that was really will willing to put in the work when he didn't even go to school or act really anymore. And um, Ever since then, he's been in seven of my movies. He actually is in the Aussie community, is trying to act more. He has a kid now, so it's been a little difficult for him to do auditions. Um, I know he wants to definitely get back out there, and I've been wanting to try to give him that opportunity. He did great in that movie, and that, uh, that movie kind of launched his career or his goals, at least in my opinion, from what he's told me. I know he wants to, at some point, move to L.A., and I'm very proud of him for what he's done so far. You just never know. Don't be afraid to reach out to people you don't know to audition. You could find a perfect actor for you that, that makes you laugh and, you know, does what you want and goes above and beyond your expectations that you set for them. Also, it doesn't just, 
you know, contacting people doesn't just help with auditioning people for that uh, fight movie I keep mentioning. Uh, I had to get a crowd of people because I messaged a bunch of people. To be able to coordinate that, just a bunch of extras of people that aren't in the film program, and you're just like, hey, do you, would you like to be in a movie? <laughs> you know, and I had about maybe 20 people that showed up that set aside their time. You know, that was really crazy. Also, the, the people that you do end up getting to help you appreciate the time that they're dedicating to your film because once you graduate school, not paying people for work is uh, not gonna cut it. After you're out of school, uh, at least when you're in college, people are a little more lenient to helping people for uh, students for free and dedicating hours on hours. I mean, I could tell. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of my friends that could tell you the hours that we put in to all of our films, but especially my films. Okay, advice number six is locations. People in college normally try to find the easiest locations. You know, whether it be their dorms or I don't know if they, if certain schools have a studio, but we had this place called our film house. And it used to be, we had a film house where we had school and then a studio house that was a old frat house, I believe, or an old nursery or something. I can't remember. At the time, it was very nice. Um, you could decorate the walls. There was furniture in it. Sometimes there'd be clothes. You could move stuff around. Um, do kind of whatever you wanted. There was a lot of people that would take advantage of that space and only ever use that space. And in reality, you're not gonna be doing any of that when making a movie. Um, you're gonna have to find locations at some point, deal with people and their schedules and agreements. It, I mean, obviously starting out, it was very helpful and I appreciated having it there at first. But after a while, you would just start seeing movies and it's all in the same spot. You know, those music videos that are all shot in that one studio in LA or that, um, that one, that one place in LA that like Greece was shot and where they were driving down that um uh, you know what I'm talking about I don't know where it is but yeah the uh where the cars drive in the race at the end of Greece and I'm pretty sure drive was shot there too at one point and I don't know it kind of I guess it's kind of cool but it kind of takes you out of it just using the same locations over and over even if you're not a, a producer or want to be an AD I think when you're in school, starting out, it's very important to find your own locations, especially if you're directing or writing it. Like, it's your movie, you know, when you want to say in the locations. I believe the first movie that we end up finding a bunch of different locations and not using a dorm or anything was that, um, that fight movie. We end up finding a really cool warehouse to shoot in. It was owned by somebody, but the, it was just used as like a weird like storage area. There was old antique stuff. Um, some of the electricity didn't work. There was one of those gynecologist chairs like in the basement. You know, I don't know if people, men that's never been in the gynecologist, you put your legs up in the stirrups like this, you know, and it spreads them open. There was one of those for some reason down there, yeah, but it was great for what, what, where we were shooting. So when searching for locations for my Golden Dream movie, we actually found this place uh, that was like a scuba place uh, an hour away from Nacogdoches. It's called Texan Scuba at Blue Lagoon in Savala, Texas. There's very, very clear water, and I, they were natural springs, so the water was hella cold, but it was a nice little area, and I found that literally just by looking on Google Maps and being like, is there blue water anywhere? <laughs> really, like, clear water. <laughs> That's pretty much how I found it. I just Google mapped, like, most of my locations. That's not on private property. The first one I found 
was like a blue lagoon, but I guess there was it was private property, so also for my one movie, Lotus, I found this really cool Airbnb out in the middle of nowhere. This Airbnb was built in around the eighteen forties and is super historic. We end up I end up renting uh renting it for a night to shoot there. It was pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, it was very eerie for sure, but I, I think it was one of one of the cooler locations. I just find it more rewarding to find your own locations. <laughs> Advice number seven is don't be afraid to ask for help. Now I am very guilty of this. Clearly, um, I. I like figuring it out myself. I like doing it myself. I feel like I can't grow if I do it myself, but this is not necessarily true. You know, when you're making a movie, it's not just your movie. It's a group effort. It's a team effort. You, some, I've, yes, I've seen some short films where somebody wrote it, directed, acted all by themselves. I think you could do so much more if you had a team standing right behind you. And then you can say, be like, look at all these uh, memories that we developed together as a team. Like, uh, it took me a while to figure that out. When I first started in college, actually, I had to have my friend Juliet basically tell me, yo, you need to relax and you need to let me help you. You can't just be a micromanaging bitch, <laughs> basically. I was like, you're right. <laughs> you're right. Uh, I was so afraid that everybody else was just doing it wrong. Even the first day I got there. I forget what happened in the conversation. Him saying something like, you're not gonna make any friends like acting like that or something. Or how are you going to make any friends um, if you're trying to do everything yourself? Which I wasn't over here like, oh, let me just make this movie by myself. No, it's just like I had strong opinions, basically. I wasn't that stupid. I like knew I needed other people's help. And I was like, I'm not here to make friends. I remember saying that to his face like the first day, like the first day of class. Oh. It took me a while to figure out that you don't have to be so serious all the time to make a good movie. I just, when I got there, I saw a bunch of people that didn't take film seriously, saw it as a joke, which is fine. It's supposed to be fun. It's an art, but I was, I was too determined, I think. Um, I was too serious about it. I just wanted to be good, and I thought... I thought being serious about it um, was going to get me there. It's important to acknowledge that filmmaking is a team effort and everybody's helping everybody and it's okay to ask for help. Uh, whether it's asking your professors for help, no, and asking for advice from other people that's been doing this for a long time. Ah, I don't think enough people ask for help. I can't see. And I think it's okay to ask for a second opinion. And it's definitely helped me make my films better. Oh! And it's okay to be stubborn. It's okay to fight for what you want, what you believe in. If it's your movie, you directed, you wrote it, and you don't want anybody's opinion, that's okay. Uh, something always happens on set. Th there's never been a smooth set I've been on. There's always been some sort of either complication or something goes wrong, or somebody didn't show up, or it could be anything. Continuity is an issue. <laughs> People aren't agreeing. Uh, it could be anything. But yeah, don't be afraid to ask for help. Oh my god, oh my god. No, don't destroy my shit. Number eight is let actors act. Sounds like a really simple thing that people would know, but there are some directors out there that stick like line per line in a script, which is fine. That's totally fine. Um, you know, Quentin Tarantino does that and his movie turns out great. I'm saying from the perspective of starting as a new filmmaker, 
I see a lot of actors not feel like they have a bunch of free range when it comes to acting. They feel as though they have to stick uh, line per line. Oh, uh, I just got rid of these dudes. What the fuck? I, so I don't want to explode these guys because then I can't get their armor from them. I mean, this is good that I'm getting a bunch of armor, but I'm trying to make a video, an informational video, and they're just ruining my train of thought because they're fucking bitches. I also find that when actors stick to a script, like line per line, uh, it definitely, you can definitely tell sometimes that it's a script and that's the... Wow. They destroyed my birdhouse tree. I hate them so much. You suck ass. Some actors plan far in advance. Ah! This dude ran over him. Wow, I've never had it be this crazy before. Okay. Well, that was fun. Anyway, some actors prepare like months for a part and you know they develop this character in their head. It's kind of hard when you know like you have to you know say these certain lines these certain way. When I was watching that same video of the Hollywood Reporter actually um, Robert De Niro he mentioned how in The Irishman or just like in general working with uh, Martin Scorsese he Wow. He uh, allowed Robert to. God damn it. Stop. Stop. Oh, fuck you. He allowed Robert to test out ideas, and Scorsese was like, yeah, we can try it, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Which is so nice. And he said it's very, it's very relieving to have a director that's so open to ideas. But then again, you know, not everybody can understand your vision and what you see in a film so I can't say that a director that is overly strict is gonna be worse than one that has a clear vision you know all right let's see if we can hang up this baby's face all right cool it's dumb you can't use the baby's body as a uh, armor there we go little baby face <laughs> I mean come on you can't be that messed up if they give you the option to do it Right. I, I say you learn a lot from other people and they could, you never know, come up with ideas that you may never have thought of before. My number nine advice is make sure that your crew and your cast are safe. This has always been kind of a real big issue with the with filmmakers starting out. You know, people taking value of their movie over someone's life or someone's safety. I definitely can look back at films that I've done and then like, wow, that probably wasn't the safest thing for me to do. And it's obviously it's really hard when you're an indie filmmaker, starting first up filmmaker of like wanting to do something really cool but not having the means to do it because it may just not be safe. You may not have the right uh, people to do what you're trying to do. For example, anything involving fighting, maybe somebody has to swim in water, using a prop gun, that's a big one. Uh, jumping out of windows is one, filming on the side of the road is one, using explosives, basically anything that could possibly potentially put someone in harm's way, or even uh, monitoring a storm, filming dirt, uh, through a storm. I don't know if anybody knows, but there was a movie called Midnight Rider that was directed by Randall Miller that uh, took place on a set of train tracks and uh, a camera assistant, she ended up getting hit by a train. Now, these people also apparently did not have permission to be shooting on the train tracks. Um, shooting on a train track is always very dangerous unless you have the permits and the trains are not moving along that route that day. But these people did not. They didn't move in time and they were on a bridge, which I think is stupid. Like, why would you, like, I understand why, if it's for the movie, but uh, in the end, that was just, it cost somebody's life. It was definitely producers, directors, assistant directors, 
um, all, it's pretty much all their fault. <laughs> Another thing is a shooting during thunderstorms. That's a big thing. Uh, a good rule of thumb uh, when it comes to shooting when there's lightning is to make sure whenever a lightning strikes within a certain mile, I can't remember how many miles away, but I think it's at least five miles maybe. Once one lightning strike hits, you have to wait 30 minutes. And then if another one hits, you have to add another 30 minutes until it's safe. And if another one doesn't happen, uh, then you can start shooting again, but you have to basically shut down everything involving lights, anything, uh, metal, electronic, that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, and I, I've heard stories of people I know that uh, say as the DP they had to shut down a production, meaning they're like, I'm not filming anymore because of the safety of my crew. I'm not going to put my crew in harm's way for your movie. P you know, people who get mad. I mean, it makes sense. Like, they're just not, not giving a shit about crew or actors. I've had directors not care about somebody's um, safety when it came to staying up late and they had a really far drive, working a <laughs> 12, 13 hour day and then had to drive back to Dallas, Houston or whatever. And uh, that's not cool at all. Uh, if she dies because she falls asleep at the wheel, that is on you. If you film on the side of a road, you have to wear an orange vest. You have to warn the police of what you're doing as well. I think the county sheriff, we had to do that one time because I can say story time about that. But basically, in the end, I was told I need to wear an orange vest um, when I'm filming on the side of a, a road. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that till I, f I was filming and I did that myself. Uh, it's just so other people are cautious that you are on the side of the road working, doing stunts. Make sure you have a stunt coordinator. There's a lot of people that have almost died because of either lack of communication on set or just ignorance. And for example, on a high on a high and high budget movie, and now you see me, uh, Isla Fisher. She actually almost, I mean, she pretty much almost drowned. But there's a scene where she's supposed to get trapped underwater and shackled. And she uh, is supposed to be magnetic so that it comes off super easily. But apparently the chain got caught during the shot underneath this panel and she couldn't get out. And she uh, apparently was panicking and uh, they forgot to say like a safe word if something goes wrong. This is what she said in the interview. She's like, we never established like a safe word if there was something actually wrong because they just thought I was just acting. <laughs> but luckily she was able to undo the chain. She was fine, but that's still like that. That could have been, if somebody's acting like they're scared and then, how am I missing this guy's face? Wow. Oh, you've been missing me every time. You dick. I've had definitely my fair share of issues that I've ran to on set that I'm like, wow, yeah, this really wasn't safe. And it's, you know, it's because nobody tells you. Being young kids, you just don't, you don't really think about it too much, sadly. Like that's, you know, you're just like anything for the movie, but that's not true at all. That's just not, it's not good. And you should never put somebody's life um, before a movie or anything really. I don't know if certain schools teach this about safety, but I know a lot of most most sets have a safety meeting at the beginning. And actually there's been a lot of fair share sets that don't have a safety meeting a safety meeting at the beginning of the shoot day. It should be every day. Um, they don't really teach you that. Advice number ten is about being self critical something we artists know all too well. All artists are very critical of their work and of themselves. I would say from experience, it's hard to not look at a piece of art and be like, well, that's complete garbage. It's hard, even for creators, people on YouTube. I'm sure there are plenty of YouTubers that are questioning what they make because as soon as you're making something for somebody else, you start questioning it. 
especially if you put a lot of hours into it. You know, don't put yourself down too much because every experience is a learning experience and you're the only one that can uh, grow from said experience. Nobody else can help you grow. You also have to somewhat choose to grow and accept your failures if you consider them even failures. I wouldn't even consider them failures. And I've had a real big issue with that as well as like accepting that not everything I do is going to be perfect or I'm going to like it or it's going to be exactly how I pictured it. Um, but I should be proud of what I've done. I should be. And everybody should be. Because life's hard. Impressing people's hard. Making anything out of nothing is hard. Except for babies. Just kidding. Sometimes even making babies is hard. In the same interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Adam Driver said something that I thought was very intelligent. He said, you're the only one who knows what your potential is, which is true. And that uh, he always has some sort of self-regret when it comes to doing a movie or if he could do something better, uh, how he could do it better, what could he change kind of thing. He said, regardless of how long you've been doing something for, how often you've been doing it, you'll never actually know what you're doing. Like, you'll never feel 100% comfortable with doing something, which is totally true. Or like, you'll never actually figure it out. He's basically saying there's no right answer, and sometimes you just have to feel comfortable with failing. I mean, even my friends are like, hey, you know, you did a good job. Your movies are good. You're good at what you do. And I don't know why I question it, you know? Just don't let that get you down. I know starting out, it can be very hard and overwhelming, but you can do it. Anybody can do it, really. You just gotta want to want to be good and, and want to do a good job and to learn. And that's the only way you'll really improve. We've done a lot here. We got a lot done. Um, we got a lot of things fucking destroyed, which is so fun. Uh, we still have a lot to do. I still need to set up a bunch of traps. Well, I guess we'll stop here. Um, thanks for joining me if you did for this long. Um, I hope if you are starting out in college or if you are, you know, just beginning in film, you take some of this advice. Um, I kind of wish somebody would have told me a couple of things along these lines before I started, um, but you learn and you grow. I'm not saying this advice is just gonna be implanted in your mind, uh, but it's something definitely as a guideline uh, that could potentially help you um, in the future. And then, um, yeah, I'll probably do some story times at some point about my experiences on set. Uh, yeah. I never, uh, I never say at the end of a video to like and subscribe uh, and hit the bell icon for a notification. I kind of hate when people do that. So um, if you want to do it, great. If not, great. I'm just happy to for anybody to you know watch me for a full 20 minute video. <laughs> um, if you like what you see and you want to keep watching me fail miserably at playing this game or other games when I start playing other games, then go ahead and uh, subscribe to this channel. Anyway, peace out my dudes.